and the pronator teres, maybe suggesting that there was the site of compression was localized there, but really pretty much, as you can see, unremarkable. So he went on to have inferior C2 through superior C7 cervical laminectomies. And postoperatively, it was noted that he had right shoulder abduction weakness, so it was pretty moderate, with mild biceps weakness. So he started on steroid taper, and he was discharged. And upon discharge, postoperatively, there was some aching and burning across his shoulders. And 10 days postoperatively, he noted left shoulder abduction weakness um, that developed over several days. So he continued to get worse. And he was seen um, four weeks postoperatively. And here you can see this is his um, MRC score and his upper limbs. So he has moderate weakness um, kind of in the C5, C6 distribution bilaterally. He has decreased sensation in those dermatomes. And he still has findings you know, of his myelopathy. All of that has not resolved, which is we wouldn't expect. Um, but he has um, decreased biceps reflexes now bilaterally. So he has a post-operative MRI, and you can see that there's some now decompression of the um, central canal. He still has some compression at that um, C2, C3 area. Um, and then he has a little bit of a post-operative fluid collection. We're really not explaining the deficits that we see in this location. So then at this point, we think about how is an EMG going to help us? And so an EMG is going to, the role of it for here is going to be to try to determine if this is more radiculopathy. So is this some kind of stretch or injury to the root at the time of surgery? Or does this represent a plexopathy? Often in EMG, we're also trying to exclude other mimickers. I think, you know, we think like a myopathy is certainly in this situation is less likely, but we can also evaluate for things like that. It'll tell us the severity of the nerve injury. It'll tell us if it's more of a stretch demyelinating injury or if it's axonal. And it'll tell us how acute and or chronic and how um, it's progressing and prognosis over time. So just a refresher. So we'll recall that um, in terms of the dorsal root, we see that the um, cell body for the dorsal root uh, lives outside the spinal cord versus when we think about um, the ventral roots, we know that the cell bodies live in the uh, ventral component of the spinal cord. So this is important in terms of EMG as we think of um, injury in a radiculopathy occurring proximal to the dorsal root ganglion. So when we're doing EMG, we're stimulating the nerve distal to the dorsal root ganglion. So we expect the sensory responses in a preganglionic injury to be preserved. Versus if we think about a peripheral nerve injury or a plexus injury, this occurs distal to the dorsal root ganglion. And so when we stimulate on EMG distal to this, we expect that these findings will be reduced or absent. So typically in this, again, we'll go through our typical arm pain protocol, which consists of ulnar motor and median motor and sensory nerve conduction studies. So typically what we're doing for the ulnar motor is um, we're stimulating above the elbow and then at the wrist and then recording over the ADM. For the median motor study, we're gonna stimulate proximally um, right directly over the brachial artery and then at the wrist and we're, we're gonna record over the APB. The sensory studies, again, have similar stimulation sites, but now we're gonna be recording over the index finger for the median antidromic study. And then the ulnar antidromic study, we're gonna be, again, stimulating just like we did for the ulnar motor, but now we're recording over the fifth digit. So these are our typical studies. So when we think about what is this assessing? So when we do our typical arm pain protocol, we're really looking at the lower part of the brachial plexus. So the median motor and ulnar motor studies, as well as the ulnar sensory, assess the lower plexus. Whereas the median sensory study recording over the index finger tells us some information about the middle component of the plexus. So you can see in this instance, the nerve conduction studies really don't help us a lot in our case where there's primarily C5, C6 involvement. So here's the post-op EMG. Again, the nerve conduction study is really unremarkable. But now the needle EMG shows 
fibrillation potentials and long duration complex motor unit potentials. So neurogenic appearance, acute, active, um, sorry, chronic, active, the chron chronicity based on the motor unit potentials, active based on the fibrillation potentials in the C5, C6 innervated muscles. So right now we're thinking, okay, is this C5, C6 radiculopathies or is this an upper trunk plexopathy? So we don't have any sensories that we've done to assess that well. And in this case, it, we can't do the cervical paraspinals because we've just done surgery there. We know that we've you know, basically cut open the muscle and we're gonna to expect to see fibrillation potentials and changes in the motor units just based on the surgical procedure alone. So what can we do? Well, there are some sensory studies that assess the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, and we typically are thinking about the lateral anabrachial cutaneous. You could also do the median anadromic study, but record over the thumb as another way of assessing this region. So again, just to remember, the lateral anabrachial cutaneous comes from the more C6 root and then travels through the upper trunk. So in this case, um, we sent the patient back and they had more nerve conduction studies and we saw that the lateral anabrachial cutaneous response was reduced, especially on the right side. And so this kind of cements that this is an upper trunk brachial plexopathy. So certainly there's lots of causes we can think about. Most of them don't really fit in this clinical situation. However, we think about, okay, is there post-operative paralysis? So in some surgeries, obviously we're thinking about positioning of the limb and was there any stretch in terms of how the surgery was performed? We can think about idiopathic brachial plexopathies or Parsonage Turner syndrome. So that could occur um, sometimes in a post-operative session uh, um, situation or just um, with no real clear inciting factor. And then there's certainly other inflammatory plexopathies. We can see this with diabetes, sarcoid, um, and then in the post-surgical setting. So in this case, we'll pursue um, a lot of systemic autoimmune markers on the labs. Um, we'll do imaging to evaluate often for any kind of structural cause, including malignancy, although that would be really unlikely in this situation. And then spinal fluid can tell us again, if there's a um, suggestion of inflammation with elevated protein or in other cases of plexopathy, looking to see if there's um, malignant cells on cytology. So in our patient, the brachial plexus imaging was normal and extensive laboratory studies were normal. So this represents a post-surgical inflammatory neuropathy. And so um, we looked at our series of patients here. Um, so we had 21 biopsy confirmed inflammatory neuropathies that occurred in the post-surgical setting. And it occurred pretty equally in men and women um, with a wide range of onset. There were some features um, that um, were maybe predisposing features. So if patients had a pre-existing peripheral neuropathy or had diabetes or a concomitant cancer or infection, um, there was a higher rate associated in these patients. They often had some concomitant weight loss. So this is something we see in inflammatory plexopathies of a lot of different causes is that there is weight loss associated and it's usually out of proportion to the amount of atrophy that we see. And then the NIS score, so the NIS is called the Neuropathy Impairment Score, and it's a sum score of motor, sensory, and reflex impairments, and it ranges from 0 to 244. And so for what is often a focal problem in these cases, it's a pretty moderate deficit. So I think this table is interesting. So typically um, in these patients, the time from surgery in some cases was less than 24 hours. Although, in how we differentiate this from just a typical post-surgical stretch or some kind of injury is that often these patients don't necessarily have deficits right when they wake up. They may come on over the next several hours. Um, in this case, they could range up to usually within a, a week or so. And then um, they continually progress. So we wouldn't expect a surgical complication to continue to show progression once the, the, the surgery is over. So that also is that kind of a, one of those helpful clinical clues. 
But you can see that this occurred after um, many different types of surgeries. So this case is unique in that the neuropathy was near the site of the surgery, but often it's very remote. So we can see these occurred after root canals, I mean, many different types of surgeries. And the neuropathies are often focal. So we saw a lot of sciatic or focal plexus abnormalities. Sometimes they were a more diffuse polyradiculoneuropathy. Um, and so you can see again, the sites were often multifocal. So multiple plexuses are, or one plexus. And again, these patients often have pain. They have pretty significant impairments from their neuropathy. You can see here the weight they sometimes lose, like some patients over 100 pounds associated with the onset of this inflammatory uh, disorder. So the EMG shows what we'd expect. We see findings of neurogenic injury. So we see fibrillation potentials and um, uh, neurogenic motor units with reduction in the motor and sensory responses. And then we have MRIs. So here's kind of some of the typical MRI features. So we typically see T2 hyperintensity. So here you can see T2 hyperintensity in um, the sciatic nerves. And then you can see, um, in this case, you can see T2 hyperintensity in the C8 uh, root and lower trunk. This was after a hip surgery. Uh, the case on the lower left, you can see um, T2 hyperintensity enlargement of the femoral nerves as well as a little bit in the sciatic nerves. And this was after a circumcision. And then the last case on the right was again, um, enlargement and hyperintensity of the sciatic. And this was after a root canal. So typically we see signs that are sort of nonspecific, just suggest some sort of generic inflammation in the nerves. So they're not diagnostic of a particular pathology, but helpful in excluding malignancy or some other etiology. So these are the nerve biopsy findings in these cases. So these are individual T's nerve fibers, um, and these are stained with osmium. And you can see here, this case shows um, fulminant late axonal degeneration. So this is further along in the process of axonal degeneration. So you're seeing all of these myelin ovoids. In the case on the upper right, you're seeing more acute fulminant axonal degeneration. So it's not quite as progressed as in um, the figure in box A. But you can see that again, there's myelin ovoids forming. These are um, semi-thin epoxy sections. So you can see multifocal fiber loss. So these are fascicles. And um, you can see that half of the fascicle and C is devoid of fibers. You can see one of the other fascicles has none. So there's multifocal fiber loss both within and between fascicles. And then on close-up high power, you can see that there's lots of degenerating profiles. We often see findings also with ischemic injury, such as neovascularization. So we see lots of little blood vessels. These are highlighted by a muscle membrane stain here, smooth muscle actin. We see lots of inflammation within the nerve, and then we see bleeding. So kind of an ischemic microvasculitis um, with inflammation. So over time, however, these patients often have a monophasic illness and they do better. So this is the NIS that shows improvement over time. Um, patients who um, um, were treated are solid lines. Those that are dashed lines did not receive treatment, but you can see overall these patients all showed either stabilization or improvement. So how do we kind of get at the, the pathology. So often we're considering distal cutaneous and nerve biopsies if we can. You know, these are easier, less risky procedures. So we commonly are targeting um, these nerves most commonly. I think the sural is by far the most common one we do, um, but we do some of these others as well. When the process is really focal, these distal cutaneous nerve biopsies may have a yield of only 50%. So in those cases, sometimes we have to do a targeted fascicular biopsy where we'll target the abnormality in the nerve by the physical exam, the EMG, and the MRI. And we know in brachial plexus biopsies from our experience here with um, Dr. Spinner that these have a yield of 74%. And you can see the varied pathologies that we're evaluating for. The complication rate is about 19%, but about 4 to 5% with kind of fixed either numbness or weakness post 
biopsy. So in this case, we were lucky. We were able to do a, a lateral and a brachiocutaneous biopsy because of the involvement of the upper trunk and the findings on the EMG. We did see some inflammation in this biopsy as well. Um, and this patient was treated with IV methylprednisolone. We usually give a gram weekly for three months. And there was some um, stabilization and improvement even at three months. Um, and then the patient was lost to follow up after that. Okay. So let's do another discussion of another case. So this is a 65-year-old man who developed low back pain on the left side after doing light work. It was radiating to his left thigh and over days, um, it went into the left shin. And then over about three weeks, he developed a complete foot drop. His MRI only showed abnormalities on the right, so it didn't really fit. And his outside EMG was confusing in that it showed a left perineal neuropathy. So really nothing was done here, but he really had no improvement in this foot drop over time. So he goes on and then two years later, he has a flu-like illness and that's followed by right-sided low back pain radiating into the thigh. And this time he develops more thigh weakness. His EMG suggests a femoral neuropathy outside. And his MRI is repeated and continues to show this disc protrusion at L4, L5. And this is his MRI, so you can see the disc protrusion here and a little bit of narrowing there at the foramen. So based on this, he gets a surgery. And one week later, he develops severe right leg pain, worsening quadriceps weakness, and he's unable to straighten his knee or flex his hip. His um, surgical site is re-explored because they see this post-operative seroma and there is see some compression on the canal, but it doesn't, with the re-exploration, it's not really felt to explain his symptoms. And then post-operatively, he just continues to get worse. So even after the second surgery, now he can't extend his knee. He still can't flex his hip. He's falling a lot. He's having a lot of allodynia and electrical pain. So he comes for further evaluation. Here's his exam. So the right side, you can see it's really this kind of upper lumbar involvement. So kind of L2 to L4, upper lumbar plexus type involvement. And then the left side where he had this two-year-old foot drop, he still has kind of distal deficits either in an L5 distribution potentially, could be sciatic perineal division um, as well. And he has a lot of decreased sensation um, in the left foot on the top of the foot. And then he has a lot of kind of allodynia and hyperalgesia on the right thigh. So in this case, um, when we're doing EMG for lumbosacral plexopathy, what we're trying to do is again, show abnormalities in the distribution of at least two different peripheral nerves at at least two different nerve roots. And obviously we'd like to show that it spares the paraspinal muscles if possible. However, we know that a lot of conditions that cause a plexopathy, the pathology just doesn't occur just at the plexus and it can involve the roots. So we may see paraspinal involvement. Sometimes the deficits really just are more focal. And so we don't see changes that meet these criteria. And it could be hard to distinguish a multiple mononeuropathy and a lumbosacral plexopathy. So the benefit is that it's relatively easy to assess the lumbosacral plexus. So the anatomy is less complicated. We can usually adequately sample multiple regions of the plexus efficiently, but we do have few testable sensory nerves in, in the lumbosacral plexus. So our routine sensory studies, again, are the SIRL, which assesses both tibial and perineal, and it's an L5-S1. The superficial perineal, which is a perineal L5. But it's difficult to assess proximal segments. You know, we've just got thicker tissue, more adipose, more bu muscle bulk. So it's harder to get down to those sensory nerves and not have muscle artifact. And we can do the saphenous, which is a femoral extension of the femoral nerve, but it's frequently absent in normals, especially in older patients, like our patient. So here we did nerve conduction studies and the typical nerve conduction studies on the right leg are normal. And we're not surprised because the process is really more L2 to L4 and we're just not assessing those segments. 
The needle examination does show active denervation. This looks more acute even than our last case. And it involves the iliopsoas, the adductor, the quads, and then as well as some evidence of the involvement of the TA and the gastroc. So it's a little more diffuse, right? We're not seeing just one, we're seeing more than one nerve, definitely, more than one root. And so this would favor a plexopathy, even though we can't assess the sensory response as well here. We could have tried the saphenous, we didn't. Um, and we couldn't do the paraspinals again because the patient has had surgery. So in this case, it looks like a, again, lumbar plexopathy. And we think about the reasons. This wouldn't be our typical post-surgical inflammatory because this was occurring even prior to the surgery and was progressing throughout these two surgeries, not necessarily caused by that. And so again, he had extensive studies um, for evaluation. So, uh, oh, just another note, we also did the left leg as well. And we can see that there was basically some residual changes in L5-S1 muscles, most severe in L5 on the left side. Again, no clear sensory involvement. So we don't know if this was an L5 or if it was a residual of a prior plexopathy there as well. So when we think about lumbosacral plexopathies, again, there's a lot of different causes. In this case, we have to consider more things because it was occurring even before surgery. So we need to think about those malignant invasions, metastases, um, about, we need to think about other inflammatory causes. And this is where the diabetic and the lumbosacral uh, radicular plexus neuropathies come into play. So these are inflammatory um, conditions. It occurs more commonly in diabetics, but it can occur in non-diabetics um, as well. And so you get inflammation um, in the nerves with microvasculitis. And these again are typically monophasic illnesses. So this is what we're doing an evaluation for. And so in this case, the patient did not have diabetes. Um, vasculitis workup was negative for a more systemic involvement. And then the spinal fluid did show an elevated protein and we did, we looked for amyloid as well and that was negative. So um, this was the MRI of the lumbosacral plexus. And basically what I wanted to highlight here because showing the femoral and the L4 involvement was really slight um, hyperintensity, but you could just see the atrophy on this right side in that compartment um, comparatively uh, to the left. Um, so this case, uh, we think about, again, targeting a fascicular biopsy. So we've shown in series here, again, with Dr. Spinner, that the sciatic can be done really safely. So we either do a buttock or a posterior thigh approach. And the yield has been about 85% with many different diagnoses found. Complications, about 4.5% of those have been permanent, um, with about 2.7% having permanent numbness in the perineal division. Really not that different from what we see with the distal superficial perineal biopsy. Now, there are a couple of things you don't want to biopsy. And so you really want to recognize a neuromuscular choristoma before you go and biopsy it because once you, once you intervene on that, then they could go on to develop desmoid tumors. So that accounted for some of the complications in the series. Now, we don't have a series on our femoral neuropathies, but anecdotally, the only ones where I've seen worsened weakness or more complications has been from femoral. So I'm always a little bit more nervous about doing a targeted femoral biopsy, which in this case would be more helpful. Um, you could do the saphenous, but again, the saphenous um, may not be involved here. It's more distal to where the problem is, and it's a really small nerve, so you just don't get a lot of tissue to look at under the microscope. So in this case, um, despite the symptoms being two years old on the left side, they decided to go with the superficial perineal biopsy. And in this case, it really showed findings consistent with what we call non-diabetic lumbosacral plexopathy. So similar to our post-surgical cases, you can see multifocal fiber loss. So some fascicles are really affected, some are normal, more normal affected here in the middle. And you can see this very thick um, perineurium and injury neuroma. So this has been disrupted and you can see all these little micro fascicles forming. We see inflammation involving the blood vessel walls with disruption of the blood vessel walls. And then you see lots of bleeding. 
So in our series of lumbosacral radicular plexus neuropathies, we've looked at both non-diabetic and diabetic varieties. And typically what happens is these start with pain and then they're followed by weakness. So usually by the, when they first start their pain, by the time they come to see us, the pain is sort of subsiding and weakness becomes their predominant problem. And that's true of both of those. Typically these are perineal or sciatic predominant or their femoral predominant in terms of the anatomic site that's involved. And then usually um, by the time um, we see them again, they're in a walker or a wheelchair, but we know that at follow-up, these patients have less weakness, they do improve, and they have less use of um, gait aids over time. So this is a monophasic illness. It does tend to improve, but you can see they still do often have lasting deficits. What we also were able to see in the study is that, again, um, you know, pain is often the most common thing um, at onset. And then um, by the time they're here, again, it's more often that weakness is the problem. And again, the anatomic location. But what I wanna highlight is often when the symptoms start, it's unilateral, but um, they often become bilateral and they stay as asymmetric. So it's usually one leg, pain, there's a lot of contact allodynia, weight loss, then it becomes weak. Then it tends to go to the other side, follow similar findings, but be less severe. So again, it can be quite a long monophasic illness. So a lot of times we do try to intervene if they're still having pain or the weakness is still progressing to try to limit the amount of deficits. There's not great data for this. We did do a study here of um, it was supposed to be IV methylprednisolone and IVIG versus IVIG, but there was an IVIG shortage. So we did see with IV methylprednisolone that there was less pain, but we didn't see a lot of effect on weakness. And that's hard here because we certainly have a referral bias and we're seeing patients often late into the course of their disease. And so maybe we've already lost too much. So we try if possible to treat them early. And again, we treat them similarly to the post-surgical inflammatory cases. Okay, so this is a, another case. This is a 52 year old woman who presented to me um, for evaluation of a second opinion regarding her cervical spine and issues she was having with her arms. So she'd had a year of numbness and tingling that was intermittent in her hands. It was mainly sounded carpal tunnel like, mainly with biking, repetitive activities. And then she had this um, fall in the shower. It was caused by taking some sleeping aid after a long trip and she fell on her left side. So immediately after that, she was noticing neck pain <clears throat> and electrical sensation that was going down her dorsal arms into her hands. And she was having difficulty with balance, running and going downstairs. And she felt really unsteady and vertiginous. So what we had was that she had gone to a tertiary spine center. She was told her MRI of her spine was normal, but at this time we didn't have any images or a report on that study. We did have her MRI of the brain, which looked unremarkable for the vertigo. And she had been treated with an epidural steroid injection, PT and traction and had brief benefit. And they wanted to do a second injection, but she wanted another opinion. She had been seen by a neurologist and ENT with normal evaluations and she was taking Advil for her pain. So on her exam, you know, really modest deficit. So a little bit of weakness in her right hand in the inner osseae muscles and a little bit of toe extension on the left. She was areflexic, which was interesting. And she had some mild distal sensory loss. She had some findings suggestive of compression neuropathies. She had a positive Romberg and a, her tandem was mildly impaired. So at this point, I thought her exam really looked more like a peripheral neuropathy or with um, compressive mononeuropathies rather than anything that looked myelopathic. So I let the cervical spine go at this point and didn't have the outside images, but didn't think we really needed to repeat them based on our exam. So based on what I saw, I sent her for an EMG. And this was just to look for neuropathy again and to look for any cervical radiculopathy. And the interesting things we saw was that her conduction velocities were really slow and her distal latencies, how long the, the response was taking to get there was really long as were her F waves, which were a sign of 
proximal demyelination. So this looks like a really demyelinating neuropathy, which is interesting with their history with being so abrupt. And so what we didn't see were any findings on the EMG of conduction blocks. So we look for findings when we stimulate that we see a progressive reduction in amplitude, suggesting that the impulse is not getting through. And we did not see that in her, nor did we see any findings of what we call temporal dispersion. So if you have demyelination, you could think that some fibers are gonna conduct normally, and some fibers when they're demyelinated will conduct slowly. So when you combine those, when you go progressively more proximal, you're gonna see what we call a dispersed response. So you don't see that distally, you got a nice normal response, but as you're shocking and sending electricity through the demyelinated areas, you get this dispersion. So we typically see this in acquired forms of demyelination like CIDP. We don't usually see that in inherited Charcot-Marie tooth because the demyelination is not multifocal and inflammatory, it's really diffuse throughout the nerve. So this looked like a demyelinating neuropathy. We think about inherited was a high likelihood of this case, right? She hadn't really noticed it. Um, she has no acquired sense of demyelination on her EMG. We would also think about CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyridicular neuropathy. Um, some of the paraprotein associated disorders like IgM and POM syndrome have significant demyelination and then lymphoma can as well. So interestingly, her CSF protein was extremely elevated, 847. So we usually don't see this in an inherited process. So this again raised the possibility of, was this an inflammatory demyelinating condition? And then we did genetic testing for CMT and that was normal. So then I said, oh, let's look at her roots. Let's see if her roots look big because what we notice in CIDP or forms of inflammatory demyelination because of the repetitive D and remyelination that you get enlargement, you get lots of Schwann cell processes around the um, axon and so the nerves get big or hypertroph hypertrophic. So we look for that and what we saw, this was her quote normal C-spine MRI that came and she clearly has an abnormal C-spine MRI. She has huge roots all throughout the cervical spine. She certainly has no narrowing in the spinal canal, so that was normal. But you can see the roots are really big once they exit uh, the dura. So here, then we went and imaged her more because that was really interesting. And you can see all of her lumbar roots are also very enlarged. She has some little bit of nodularity in her lumbar roots, but again, they're all very thickened. Some extend in within the canal, but mostly it's um, once the nerves leave the canal. You can see there's a little bit of enhancement and you can see just how big the nerves are in T2 hyperintense as well on this images. So this really would be more suggestive of CIDP rather than an inherited cause. So in this case, the patient underwent a targeted sciatic biopsy. So again, these are normal teased fibers. This is what we'd expect to see. Um, we could see the nodes here. Um, and so we see normal inner node distance. We see normal myelin um, across all of the different fibers. And then this is what we saw in her case. So we just saw these thick rope-like profiles. So you can see some areas with normal myelin. You can see some demyelination. But you can see all these thick like ropes where there's not even any myelin present. And then on um, paraffin stains, you can see these kind of world processes where there should be normal fibers. You can see it a little bit better on the trichrome. And then this is an S100 stain that stains for Schwann cell processes. And you can see that all of these Schwann cells um, around the nerve fibers are staining. So these are all onion bulbs, what we see with chronic D and remyelination. Uh, this is an epoxy section, so looking close up on semi-thin sections, you can see again here these onion bulb formations. Some of them have a myelinated fiber, some have none, very chronic appearing, and then you can see a few more normal myelinated fibers. And this is just another picture, higher power, you can see just how huge some of these onion bulbs are, they're just very large. So in her, um, sometimes we get two pieces of the targeted biopsy. So typically we're taking one to two fascicles of um, 
nerve when we do a targeted fascicular biopsy to minimize um, deficits. So this was another piece, and you can see it's much less abnormal than the other one. You can see some demyelination, um, but we don't see as much of the rope-like processes as we saw. And then here you can see some of the more smaller onion bulbs um, here, here, um, and then a lot more normal fibers. So a more mixed pattern where there's some very normal appearance and then some scattered onion bulbs. And that's just it on higher power again, and you can see the onion bulbs. So when we think about these fibers, we kind of classify them. And these were our typical old classification where we had normal, D and remyelination, axonal degeneration, remyelination, hypertrophic, um, like we might see in hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies. Um, but then we came up with some new classifications. And so in this case, where we see these thick um, rope like structures, we found that in 60% of our, our patients who had CIDP. So these thick, widened um, rope like fibers without nodal structures are really suggestive of CIDP on the teased fibers as well. And so then we think about the onion bulb patterns. So sometimes you see onion bulbs all throughout the specimen. That's more of a generalized pattern. We see this more often in Charcot-Marie tooth versus the mixed pattern, like what we saw here with normal fibers interspersed with onion bulbs. And this is more often seen with CIDP. And these are pictures taken from different CIDP patients. Just to highlight another hypertrophic neuropathy that we've studied a lot here um, is a perineurioma. You guys might have seen these as well in terms of biopsying them. Typically, we don't resect them, but they're a fusiform enlargement of the nerve that's genetic. Uh, it's not hereditary, but it's caused by um, mutations within the nerve um, DNA. And so you can see these world structures, it looks really hypercellular compared to what we see with CIDP. And the main difference is these are made out of perineurium, hence the name of perineurioma. Um, and the S100 is negative for all the worlds, only positive for epithelial membrane antigen. Um, and the S100, the Schwann cell only stains the axon in the inside, but they can look somewhat similar. So this is, um, occurs in about 10% of CIDP patients where you get the significant hypertrophy. And they can, as we see, mimic structural radiculopathies due to the hypertrophic roots. And this patient was treated with weekly IVIG. With some improvement, we can imagine that with all of this onion bulb formation and scarring, that this is very chronic and very difficult to treat in terms of seeing significant improvements. Okay, so the last case is one you guys have probably seen probably more often than I do, but um, so this was a 62-year-old man who had a convexity, a convexity meningioma resection. So first um, was subtotal because it was invading um, blood vessels and then had to have a second one. Um, after that was had to have, uh, said to have a postoperative stroke with residual right arm and leg weakness. So that's the background. But he came to see us because he was having three years of leg incoordination and falls, and then developed low back pain. It was non-radiating at the time, and he had some mild multi-level disease on MRI, but nothing really significant. And he noted some numbness and tingling on the lateral legs and the bottoms of his feet, and he had difficulty moving his toes. So at one and a half years, ago, he underwent um, bilateral microsurgical debridement of the facets and had rhizolysis and then had an L4, L5 laminotomy and disectomy. No improvement in his sensory symptoms, and he was continuing to have epidural steroid injections for his low back pain. So currently, when I saw him, he was describing burning across his buttocks, difficulty standing from a low seat and going up steps, and he was having still radiating radicular pain from his buttocks down to the bottoms of his feet. He also described some urinary urgency, some mild findings at that point in incontinence, no erectile dysfunction. And his lumbar spine just had mild spinal stenosis, mild to moderate neuroforaminal stenosis, but nothing too significant. And his MRI brain was okay. And he had had an MRI of the cervical and thoracic spine um, within the last year and a half, which were said to be normal. 
So his exam shows weakness mainly on the right. And we can see, you know, we know he has an upper motor neuron deficits on the right. He's hyperreflexic. He's got an extensor plantar response. He's got some upper motor neuron potentially pattern of weakness. And we know he had a stroke there. So a lot of that seemed referable to that. And then he has a little bit of decreased pinprick kind of in a perineal distribution. So here is nerve conduction studies um, were normal, but his needle examination just showed really chronic mild radiculopathies kind of being from um, L4 to S1, a little worse on the left than the right, but no active denervation, but no neuropathy either. So, you know, it still sounded a lot like neurogenic claudication. His MRI of the L spine was normal, really pretty unremarkable. And then this was his outside one from two years earlier, just so we can see this was the lumbar and you can see the thoracic. These are not great quality films, but there was nothing really remarkable noted about those. So we just, I had him see neurosurgery because I just thought, gosh, this sounds so much like neurogenic claudication, but I'm just not seeing it. Um, and so um, they got a dynamic MRI of the lumbar spine. And again, we just really didn't see any compression there. So he went on, we weren't sure what to do, uh, but he went on to develop urinary and bowel frankincontinence. And he then he couldn't stand for more than a few minutes. He had difficulty going upstairs. He was needing a walker and the numbness was going up his legs and he was having pain in both legs. So at this point, Here's his exam. Now it's definitely worsening. And now he's developed bilateral upper motor neuron signs. So we can't blame all of that on the stroke. Both toes are up going. He's got a lot of distal sensory loss. So the kicker was that he then had an MRI of his thoracic spine. And um, now in this one, which was a much better quality image than the one done previously, showed this T2 hyper intense signal all throughout the thoracic spine. Uh, spinal cord. And you could see here these vessels, and I'll show you a little bit more. So this is um, on axial imaging, and you can see the T2 hyperintensity basically diffusely involving the cord all the way down to the conus. And then on um, Imaging, uh, so Fiesta imaging, and we could see all of these um, serpiginous vessels on the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord um, with some patchy linear enhancement was noted. And so again, this is very concerning for a dural, dural AB fistula. So he underwent a T3 to T6 laminectomy and had a dural AV fistula disconnection. Again, this was after further studies, obviously with MRA in this case and um, angiogram. So we initially stabilized with some improvement, but as we see with some of these post bad cord injuries um, that there was gradual decline, even though there was no evidence of a recurrence of his fistula. So spinal dural AV fistulas, as you I'm sure well know, are arteriovitus shunts that lead to arterialization of the venous plexus and you get retrograde venous drainage and intramedullary edema due to the venous hypertension. And in our series here, we looked at 153 patients. Again, this is most common in men. They really present most with weakness, but keep in mind that sphincter disturbance um, and often have sometimes mistaken for neuropathies because of their weakness and their sensory symptoms. They often have claudicatory symptoms. And just like our patient who we saw, there's often a significant delay in diagnosis. And just think about the weakness again, being exacerbated by exertion, relieved with rest, often due to this vascular phenomenon. And I just thought, you know, when I went back and I looked at all of the imaging studies of this patient, and this wasn't called by our radiologist too, but when you just catch those couple of sequences, you can see that bright signal probably in the in the lower in the conus even then. But you know, we often don't get axials through, through that region; um, they don't go up that high, and so um, that's always unfortunate. So.
just note again, sphincter disturbances, even though they're not there at presentation, they become very common like in this patient. And we wanna be careful about looking for upper motor neuron signs or combination as being a clue. And, um, you know, the MRI shows the T2 signal abnormality often involving the conus. And so usually in L-spine, we should see something, but often we need to get thoracic spine to see all of the extent of the abnormalities. And angiography is used most commonly, but we know we're using MRA more at least to limit the amount of dye and risk and to kind of narrow things down to where we want to do the angiographic uh, injections. And here's again the common findings. So the high signal, the serpiginous blood vessels, you can see here highlighted on the contrasted image. And then this showing the injection and showing the abnormal vein, draining vein. So outcomes, patients often improve in terms of weakness, but we don't necessarily see as great of an improvements in numbness, pain, and sphincter disturbances. But functional status from the weakness standpoint certainly does improve. And, um, you know, surgery, as you guys know, is I'm sure the treatment of choice. I'd be interested to hear if people are advancing endovascular therapy of these as well. Um, so in conclusion, um, just to remember that post-surgical and diabetic, non-diabetic radicular plexus neuropathies um, can mimic structural spine disease. We often see these patients after they've seen had some sort of surgery to start with. Um, the post-surgicals are often not immediately present post-operatively, but even if they are, they usually continue to demonstrate worsening, which su su suggests a different etiology than just the surgery. Um, imaging of the plexus and EMG are helpful in showing that the involvement is outside of one nerve distribution and, um, and can help clarify that it's a postganglionic injury. Um, and then we often do fascicular nerve biopsies to help increase our yield um, when we combine them with our EMG and MRI abnormalities. Um, just to highlight those rare cases of hypertrophic neuropathies that can mimic a radiculopathy. And then the spinal dural AV fistulas, for me, it's always being aware of both the combination of the upper and the lower motor neuron findings, being very um, careful about getting the history of urinary retention, especially which sometimes is difficult in these older men with prostate problems, and to think about imaging the T-spine to really capture um, the flow voids and the, and the T2 signal abnormality. All right, thanks very much. I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. Let me stop sharing. And there. Michelle, that was terrific. Um, thanks again. Sorry, I kind of was, um, I'm on call this week, so I didn't get a chance to um, see you early on, but what a yeah. terrific presentation. Thanks. Good to see you. Um, good to see you as well. Let me um, pull up. We had some good questions on the chat. So, okay. Um, uh, Mark De Dekatowski um, asked if you could comment on the potential role of um, uh, vancomycin powder. So I don't know if you know this, but we yeah. use, you know, intraoperatively at the end of some of these cases, uh -huh. um, we sometimes use uh, vancomycin powder to sort of sterilize the wound. Oh, um, and, and what, just a typical laminectomy or No, anything, it's more, or? it's typically more for complex cases. Okay. L longer um, times, longer surgical times. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Um, and so he wanted to know uh, mm -hmm. potential role for post-operative neuropathy from, if you, if you know if there's any literature on that. Yeah, I don't think that there is any literature that I'm aware of. I mean, I don't think of VANC particularly in my practice as being neurotoxic, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily think of that one. There's always question about fluoroquidolones um, and neuropathy, flagell, that's another one that we see with prolonged use, but I, not bank. And then we have another question from Akshal Patel, who's one of our endovascular uh, neurosurgeons. Um, he wanted to know, let's see. Um, so he asked, he said, if there's one fistulous connection on angiogram, um, then it's possible to cure with endovascular approaches. If we see multiple connections, then surgery is often easier and better for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
he's asking about intraoperative monitoring mm -hmm. um, and whether you think um, doing sphincter monitoring and uh, motors uh, should be done for these patients uh, during intraoperative angiograms. Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, I would say that interoperative monitoring is certainly expanding and continuously into more areas. I mean, our practice has exploded over the last several years in terms of cases we monitor, like that case I showed of the cervical, that was from 01. So I looked back, no monitoring was done back then, but um, typically that would have been a cervical, you know, case that we would have monitored at this time. I do not know that we are monitoring the sphincter commonly. Um, we typically are doing other L5S1 muscles, but not necessarily sphincter, but um, certainly that, mm -hmm. and whether or not to do it during angio is a good question. I don't think we are routinely here, although I know we're doing it during other angio cases, like in tumor cases, it's just getting more and more. So we might be, and I don't know. Yeah. And then um, we have another uh, question from Dr. Dillon. Mm -hmm. um, What's the reason for, do you think, uh, in inflammatory polyneuropathies, um, and some of them seem to worsen after surgery? What do you think is the mechanism of that? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting. You know, these um, we see neuropathies after any kind of um, infection, right? We see them after flu, surgery, postpartum. So I think anything that can rev up the immune system, like you're trying to heal from a surgery, a lot's happened. I think you get that inappropriate attack of the peripheral nerve. So I think that's why it can come on with surgery. Um, it should, I think it worsens post-surgery because that inflammatory process has now been triggered and it's ongoing. And so that really helps you know it's more likely inflammatory rather than just a surgical complication, especially when it's in the site of the, the surgery, which can be difficult to differentiate. And then how about Michelle? So mm -hmm. there's this big push, you know, from, I don't know how it is at Mayo, mm -hmm. but a lot of the larger systems, you know, everyone's so freaked out about cost right now. Yeah. And so one of the things they look at, they go, well, geez, Dr. Skouian, your neuro monitoring is mm -hmm. so, it's, it's getting more and more expensive every year. Mm -hmm. Do you really need to have it for these spine cases that you're doing? Um, what do you think is a good, uh, like, do you think we should use it on every fusion that we do? Mm, that's a good question. For fusions, it seems probably appropriate to do MEPs and SEPs, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the big thing about interoperative monitoring is we need to put more stuff into the literature to support its utility, and that's lacking. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that needs to be a big push for our center and all, all, all big centers is to really show that it shows meaningful utility. That will help us. And what do you guys do at Mayo? Do you, is, there, is, is, is every mm -hmm. surgeon a little bit different in terms of their use or? Yes, there is some differences between surgeons. I would say it's getting more standardized as time goes on and more and more utilized. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have to get back to you in terms of, you know, which ones do we always monitor for? But I would say, you know, lots of all thoracic complex fusions. Yes, you know, we're doing monitoring. Um, I don't know if all cervical fusions are being monitored. And then how about, we have another question mm -hmm. here, um, about monitoring in these really high grade stenoses. Yeah. You know, where you have like a flicker of like one leg has just maybe every now and then you get a twitch of motors. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we should be monitoring cases where there's not much function? Oh, I guess you have to think about, do you get, it's hard to monitor if you have not much function to begin with, because you mm -hmm. might not have a response to follow. Mm -hmm. I think it's good to check to see what your pre-function is, you know, at the beginning of mm -hmm. the case, obviously, and if there's something to monitor. Um, but um, yeah, so we would do that. I mean, if there's not much function, but there's something valuable to lose, then yes, yeah, so that might give you a clue you know, for say sphincter disturbance, you know, if you're seeing some abnormality there, it might give you some idea that there's some new mm -hmm. compression or torque. And then how about, so I do a lot of lateral surgery. Mm -hmm. um, do you know of anything new or, or innovative down the road? So, you know, we do a lot like um, uh, when we do lateral surgery, you're dealing with the lumbar plexus. Mm -hmm. 
Because at that point, you know, the, the nerves have sort of become peripheral nerves and you're dealing yep. with us. Yeah. Do you know of anything that's kind of new on the horizon? That's um, because when we, whenever we do lateral surgery, it's like the the main issue is always the lumbar plexus. Mm. Do you know of any newer techniques or you know um, anything like even imaging wise? Um, any, mm -hmm. any potential? And is there any opportunities to kind of redefine that space a little bit? Yeah, for monitoring for complications yeah. in interop, other than need you know EMG looking for neurotonic discharges and things exactly. like that, which you probably exactly. are doing because you're dealing with peripheral nerves. Yeah, and then it's not like you know we don't. It's you're working through a little retractor, so mm -hmm. um, uh, you know you can't really. It's not like big peripheral nerve operation. Yeah. you can grab the nerve and stimulate. Right. It. Um, so it's like. And motors aren't really helpful. Yeah, because it's too small. Because it's, it's too small. So yeah. do, you, do you see any like opportunities there? Yeah, that's interesting. I'll have to check. You know, okay. we have um, a few people here that are really interested in expanding um, mm -hmm. that. And one would be Matt Hoffman. He might have a, be a good person um, to have do just a talk on IOM. Oh, wow. Okay. That would be great. I can, yeah send you his info, but right. he would be a really good person to give a talk on kind of monitoring and all the different cases. Right. He's sort of running our program here, so. That's awesome. Well, yeah. we really appreciate your talk, Michelle. That yeah, was sure. probably the best peripheral nerve, you know, neurology surgery related talk I've ever seen, so. Oh, thanks. It was, it was, I know it was hard to get on your schedule. It took like a year and a half to get this <laughs> schedule. Well, and now it's COVID, so it's super it's, fun. It's worth it, so. Oh, well, thanks. Time, Next time we'll have you here live in person. All right. Perfect. Sounds good. Good to see you. You too. Thanks so much, Michelle. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks care. for having me. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.